Thank you all for coming to our How to Teach a Board Game panel. My name is Jess, not Sailor Moon. I know it's confusing. Um, I have worked in board game cafes for over six years now, done a lot of things, and one of the jobs I had was being paid to teach people how to play board games. And so we are here to share that knowledge with everyone else. Now, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Arden Winner. I also used to be paid to teach people how to play board games, and now I get paid to teach people how to do databases, which is basically the same thing. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Brian. If you could believe it, I also was paid to teach people how to play board games for a while. We, we all kind of worked the same place for a little while. Um, right now, though, I currently work for a board game company. Uh, they're not paying me to be here, so I'm not going to tell you who they are. <laughs> <laughs> but I work in the customer service department, so I get a lot of the customers coming in saying, hey, your game is awful, and I'm struggling with it. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I have not worked <laughs> to teach people how to play board games, but I've been taught a lot of board games, and I think that I pick up on them quite quickly, so hopefully I can add some perspective. And by process of elimination, hey, how's it going? I'm Eric. Um, I have not been paid or by anyone to <laughs> teach board games, but I have instead paid for many board games. Uh, I own about 130 of them and have taught most of them, so yeah. Just a few. I need more. All right. Well, I have. Has this ever happened to you? Da -da. You have a game. You're really excited to play it. You found a play group, and then the explanation of the games. Uh, everyone is toning, turning out. They're just like not listening. No one's excited. And before the game even starts, the night is ruined. Maybe you won't even get to play it. So our goal is to give you some strategies to avoid this. And the first one that we like to use is to know your audience. And by that we mean like specifically understand the people who you're playing with, their experience level, um, what types of games they like to play. This also goes into when you're teaching the game. Uh, if someone has never, like by some random chance, has never played anything beyond like Monopoly and Yahtzee, uh, you're not going to come to them and be like, hey, this is a hidden roles game with a little bit of drafting and a few tile placement mechanics. Uh, that's not going to mean anything to them. They're going to be confused. We'll be right back to square one where they're tuned out and they're probably on their phone already. You're going to want to know who is playing also because that will dictate the types of games they'll enjoy. For example, I don't like deception games. I'm very bad at lying. I'm bad at them and I don't like them. It's a very clear pathway there. Um, other people may enjoy those. Uh, I have a lot of friends who really enjoy, you know, the coup, secret Hitler type of area. You know, you take them and you leave them, but they're still your friends at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, you got to know what they want to play and how much they know before you get into it too far. Okay, so this is kind of obvious, right? You should at least know how to play the game yourself before you try to teach it to somebody else. And do this well beforehand. Don't just get your group together, sit down at the table, open the box, and then set up. Take all the contents out of the box, shuffle it up. That is boring, that is awful. Don't do it. You're gonna get people on their phones, distracted, giving up already. Know the rule book, read it front to back, read it again. Even if you're planning to learn from like a YouTube video, which there's great YouTube videos out there, there's you know all kinds of different content creators whose sole purpose is to like introduce you to a game, teach you the rules really quick. It's a good thing to model your teach after actually, but if you're not doing that, if you're simply reading the rule book, read it a couple of times. Figure out the parts that you struggled with. If you have to go back and read another section because of a new rule, keep that in mind, because these are gonna be the things that your, the people you're gonna be playing with they might also be confused. So keep those things in mind. Once again, do this all beforehand. Get everything out of like the little the punch boards, get everything out of the cellophane, everything ready to go. And especially in terms of knowing the rule book, it can also be very helpful um, when you're thinking about questions that people are gonna ask. You might need to look for something in the rules, so even if you have a solid understanding of how to play the game, if somebody wants to read something out of the rule book so you need to reference something, Knowing exactly what page that information is on helps keep the flow moving, helps make it look more like you know what you're doing, um, and stops people from getting distracted and looking at the magic internet box in their pocket. Yep, yep, yep. 
So when it comes to how you provide information when you're teaching a game, one of the worst ways to structure it is usually in the order of the rule book. If you read a book to people, they will fall asleep as they've been conditioned since preschool or they'll just stop paying attention. Instead, if you have any journalism or writing experience, thinking of it like the inverted pyramid can be really helpful where you start with a really compelling and high level piece of information. For example, I'm trying to teach somebody how to play Betrayal at House on the Hill. The first sentence I'm going to start with is, we are explorers going into a haunted house. The house starts out normal, eventually becomes haunted, and then we have to try and escape or beat the ghost, or whatever the case may be. That doesn't contain any information about the rules or the setup or what minifig I'm using, but it does tell people at a really high level what game are we playing and why is it fun. This can be really helpful for people who aren't big gamers too, because big board game people don't mind when you say the first sentence is a mechanic, or this is a game that takes an hour to teach and three hours to learn, and it is co-op that shifts into competitive, right? Saying this is a game where you are in a haunted house and ghosts are trying to kill you is much more cool than this is a game where you are exploring tiles and eventually a new rule book comes onto the table. So figuring out the information that will keep things relevant and exciting for your players is really helpful and ordering it as such. There's also going to be a lot of times where it's helpful to say, I'm going to explain at a really high level this concept, like the back half of a game of Betrayal at House on the Hill, right? There will be a point where one of us is probably the bad guy. At that point, we'll give some more details on what happens then. But in the beginning of playing Betrayal, not really important to know how the second half of the game goes. So you don't need to explain those rules in excruciating detail at the start of your teaching session. People will get bored and they'll tune out. We find that similar to scoring in some ways. We'll talk about that in a little more detail too. But you want to make sure that players are getting information as they need it in a pacing that's easy for them to digest. And you're not giving that information to them way, way before they need to act on it because they'll forget or they'll get distracted or they'll get confused while you're trying to teach them. Betrayal is an interesting example, actually, because there are a few rule books. If you've ever opened up Betrayal and like stopped yourself from eating the tokens and then looked at the rule book, <laughs> um, there are a few rule books that specifically say don't read through this. I know we've just told you to read through all the rule books. For Betrayal specifically, don't read through the ones that they say don't read through them in advance. You are going to have to do a little bit of like on the fly teaching, but most betrayal scenarios don't involve anything terribly crazy. You're not setting up a marketplace and playing an entire Euro game inside of betrayal, as far as I know. That would be so crazy. sick. It would be great. That it would be, be incredible. Really cool. I would throw out like half of the expansion right. ones just to play that, yeah. but you know. And another, um, can you go back for a second? Yes, absolutely. Another interesting corner case that I like to think about sometimes with relevant information is a game called Space Cadets. If any of you are familiar with this game, it's maybe 10 years old at this point. Um, you all are piloting a spaceship together, um, and it's a very hectic, fast-paced, reaction speed mini-game pile, and each person is in control of some number of mini-games. So there is a backgammon section, there's a memory game section, there is there's like dominoes, shuffleboard. there's shuffleboard. Um, and so it takes a long time to sit and teach that game to people. And people will say, all right, well, I have the memory games component and I have the shuffleboard component, but I don't have the backgammon one, so I'm not going to pay attention during that section of the teaching because I don't, I'm not doing the backgammon board. I'm not doing that mini game because I'm not the shield engineer on the ship. About one third of the way through playing Space Cadets, the Mad Hatter comes out and says, change places. And you all have to <laughs> sw like switch seats and go sit at a different set of mini games. Uh, which, if you didn't teach everybody all of the games at the beginning of the day, ruins the experience for a lot of people. Because nobody wants to have been playing a game for 25 to 45 minutes that they spent an hour learning mm -hmm. that you have to spend another hour in the middle of not learning playing again. the game. So that's one that oftentimes you do have to structure it in kind of a weird way to say everybody has to pay attention for the entire time and then we will get into the part where we can play the game. So some of this varies a lot title to title, um, depending on how you want to be distributing this information and when. Which is why you have already read the whole rule book, right? And you know these issues before they're going to come up. So you can do that. But yes, so you have learned the game. It is now time to teach your friends. You may think that the first thing is to just like begin the rules. But my favorite thing to do 
is to distract and involve people. I like to have everyone at the table focused only at what's going on at the table. One way that make, that's really easy is asking for help setting up the board. A lot of rule books have you know, like that image, a photo of um, how the board is set up. You can lay that out and be like, hey, can you just put the cards where they look like they should go? Maybe you g pass out some decks of cards to people so that they can shuffle, so they can be doing something with their hands, getting a feel for the game, understanding what they're going to be manipulating for a while. And they're not on their phones now. <laughs> they can't, which is great. Um, it's important that people are focused on what it, like the task at hand. You can even give them like the wingspan almonds and you can just ask them to sort them by color because it's, it, you don't need to do that for the game, but it uh -huh. is something to do with your hands that is not texting. Yeah, right. and, and okay. there are people that- and They love finding out that they did not need yeah. to sort them at all. Yeah, yeah. That's you don't tell them, you don't tell them at time. Tell yeah. yeah. This is also a great time to do one final check in the rule books in case there is something you are confused about. Or maybe you've never played with this particular number of people. You have to see, does it change the hand size? Does it change? Yada, 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 yada. Cool. Finally, on to teaching the steps of the game. Um, so I'm going to go through the general overarching steps and Arden here will explain an example game. The game that you have seen all of these photos of is a Moonrakers. And so Arden's going to teach you a, a little bit. A little. a little bit. If you walk out of here knowing how to play Moonrakers, you have to give me $5. Because it seems very <laughs> unlikely, but I'm going to do my best. Also, I don't have the rules in front of me. So. Can I get a cut in on that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> $1. <laughs> $1 each. Yes. Um, OK, so the first thing, or I guess before step one, step zero, is encourage players to save their questions to the end. Um, why do I have to do that? Beach, because otherwise we'll never get anywhere. That is why. Well, um, I have a really good question. Uh, do you have a really good question? <laughs> no. Okay. What if I have a really so, bad question? So sometimes people's questions will be like, I fundamentally didn't understand what you just said to me. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. But some of the questions are information that's going to come up later, so it's good for them to get the information when you plan to give it to them and not beforehand. So that's the time when you'd say, we'll come back to that one. If you still don't get it after I explain it, right. then we can explain again at the end. Right. Agreed. Um, this is also a good time to maybe let the other people at the table who know the rules to just, just take it down, you know? Maybe go for a walk, get a snack get a drink, whatever. Um, but if you have too many people trying to teach the rules at the same time, it's just going to muddy the water. This, uh, all of these steps we are giving are just our best practices. And there's a lot of like ways you can shift it slightly and still successfully teach a board game. But I will say you can't have two people trying at the same time. Um, so the first, so then finally on to step one is to set up. You would, you know, set up the game the way the rule book tells you to. This is a good time to explain the zones to people, explain the components, explain what cards they have just been shuffling and what they mean, um, what pieces, like what the pieces do, and what, which ones different players have control over. So we're sitting down to play Moonrakers. Moonrakers is um, a kind of contract taking game where each of us are competing in order to have the best uh, ship company. Um, the way that's going to work is there are going to be different um, contracts on the board that we can try and fulfill. You'll see here's a contract row that shows you different um, missions that you can go on either to fight things or to um, go to different areas of space. Um, and each of those contracts, when you uh, complete them, gets you some points, gets you some prestige. Uh, but there will be some contracts that you can't complete on your own. So there's also an element that will involve negotiating with other players to see if they want to help you complete a contract in order for a portion of the rewards. Each player will also have some hidden secret objectives that they can complete by doing different conditions over the course of their turn or turns. Completing those hidden objectives as well as openly completing your contracts is how you're going to win. Um, you'll have this hand of different resource cards that represents different things that you can be scoring against your contracts as well as defending against hazards that are coming at you from space, um, which we represent on these hazard dice that are going to get rolled on each turn. 
Um, there's also different parts that you can buy to your ship that give you different abilities during different phases on your turn. So we have a trade row for those that will come in front of you when you purchase them by using the credits that you earn from completing your own contracts or from helping other players complete contracts. Uh, the game will end kind of immediately uh, when somebody's gotten the most points, but we'll talk about all of the different ways that you can earn points later. Um, but this is where on the board we would represent how many points each of the players have based on what you publicly know that they've completed in terms of objectives and contracts. Then I would explain how to win the particular game, um, explaining scoring only when it is appropriate though. So like for Euro games, maybe explain at the end. So um, as part of completing contracts, if I complete contracts by myself, all of the spoils of that contract go to me. I contributed all of the resources against that contract and that might be points, it might be credits, it might be other things. Um, so if I've gotten prestige from completing contracts, I'll earn those on the tracker. People can negotiate with me for a very particular contract that they might want to achieve for some reason. I can get the same type of prestige from them if we agree, right? I'll help Ryan complete this contract, but he has to give me all of the prestige for that. I'll get points for that on this tracker. And then, like I said, there are some hidden objectives that you can earn. Um, each player will have a hand of them. Some of them involve just having different um, diverse types of parts in my ship. There's different factions of ship parts that I can have. Um, and some of them might involve sabotaging other people by intentionally failing a mission that I am allied with somebody on. So you never know what exactly the motivations might be for somebody who has chosen to ally with you to help you complete an objective. They might be trying to screw you over. Then I would move on to the specific iconography in the game. So how do you read the cards? How do you read the info that's on the board? Why, like, what, what does this little image mean when it's over here versus when it's over here versus when it's over here? So um, one of the most important icons is going to be hazard. So when we go on different um, missions to complete contracts, all the people who are in the party that's going on the mission will roll on this hazard dice determined based on the type of contract. Harder contracts have more hazards to them. Um, and then when it comes to completing a contract, there will be some number in the bottom that represents different resources that have to be played by the party completing the contract in the course of that turn. So there will be thrusters, there will be engines, there will be shields, there will be guns. Um, and these resources, and energy. Um, so these resources not only represent uh, my progress towards the goal of this contract, but also give me different abilities during my turn. Most important is energy, uh, which you'll see is that little blue lightning icon. There will be times when I need energy just to complete my contract. There will also be times when I need energy to play more actions. Each uh, energy token that I play, or energy card that I play, grants me two actions. So you'll see we've got that little tree set up and we'll explain how I actually play them. But I need to be able to have enough energy to do all the things that I want to do in order to get the resources that I need in my party to complete the actual objective itself. Then I would explain how a specific turn would go. Um, so. so on your turn, you elect to either try to do a contract or stay at home. Staying at home is pretty easy. You're just recouping some credits. Um, when I am thinking about actually going in and playing my turn, though, if I'm trying to complete a contract, I would say I'm trying to complete this specific contract here. Either I'm asking for help or I'm not asking for help. If I'm asking for help, I'm going to say, uh, this contract gets me five credits and one prestige and one card. Can yes? I get involved anyways? Like, if you don't want any help, can I just, like, hitch a ride? Uh, no. We'll talk a little bit about how joining a party works in just a second. Um, so, um, so... Uh, when it comes to that negotiation, I am offering not only do I want help with this contract, but here's kind of what I'm looking for. I can also choose who I would offer it to. So I can say I want Jess or Eric or Lauren, but not you because you just asked a dumb question while I was explaining the game. <laughs> so you're not invited. I'm sorry. Um, then everybody can uh, banter back and forth about who, what they want to negotiate for. Um, and this is a specific corner case I would go into. I can offer anything for negotiation that is a current reward of the card that I'm getting or a promise. So I can say I will definitely, definitely for sure help you on your next turn or I'm gonna offer you tangible rewards. Tangible rewards are binding, non-tangible rewards. 
It's anyone's game. It, that's it's, just on your word. Yeah. So that is, means nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely worth nothing. So I could say, totally, I'll help you out. We have an alliance. We shake hands on it. And then I betray you immediately. This is fine. Um, but so that's how we would negotiate on what the, what the rewards are. Once you commit to be part of my contract, you can't back out of it because you realize it was more scary than you thought it was going to be. But then we'll go through the actual gameplay, which is, I would normally explain at this point, trying to explain how these turns work without the physical cards is very tough, and we are not cool enough to have a camera that can show you that. But basically, I would um, represent how many actions I've earned. Tell me to go back to the previous. Yes. Okay. I represent how many actions I've earned by playing my cards in this kind of tree diagram. Um, and we as a party, whoever is agreed upon to um, go against this contract, have to have all of the icons up that are in the requirements for the contract. So if it needs three orange uh, and two green and four purple, we as a group need to have all of those things. We also need to shield against all of the hazards that got rolled when we were talking about the danger of the mission. Um, so one really important thing to note also about this negotiation and discussion phase you are not allowed to talk explicitly about what is in your hand. So I can't say I have four actions and I can contribute two shields and three guns. That's against the rules very strictly. You can say, I think I can help a lot with actions. I don't know what else I can help you too much with, but I can't talk about the number of cards I would plan to play or even like I could do all of this part. You are supposed to be kind of vague in your negotiation so that it's more of a bartering and less of a math game. Agreed, okay. And I think that you actually went over the next thing that I was going to say, which is it, to explain all actions only when they become relevant. So it, I, so like what you shared about um, you, you can promise whatever you want, but it is not binding. Maybe if I was teaching this game with people, I would go through a demo turn before that, being honest and being nice, and then tell them, oh, by the way, you can lie. <laughs> um, and then finally, it is a good time to recap important details and answer questions. Do you guys have any questions for real this time, or are you OK? <laughs> Okay, no. we're moving on. Actually, no, I have a question. How yes. do I play the game? Uh, we'll get back to this. Okay. I'm help. All right. This is my this is my uh, the the tricycle uh, slide. Um, so <laughs> it's very important. You need a tricycle. Slide. Uh, I've decided to kind of make this a little bit of like impromptu story time for the five of us. Um, the the basis here is sometimes it's good to start a game, see where everybody's at and then start over. Take something like a practice turn, a round, a season, however the game is broken up, with just kind of no pressure saying like, okay, we're gonna play for a little while, we're gonna work out, you know, any questions you might not have realized you had, we're gonna go back and start again with a fresh start, new eyes. Um, who here has played code names? Big raise of hands. Has anybody tried to play code names with their parents? And then they just like, don't get it. <laughs> Like, it, it, to me, it feels like a pretty straightforward game. You know, I try to teach, it's one of the games I taught at the Board and Brew a lot, which is the, the cafe that we worked at. Mm -hmm. um, but for, always, for some reason, there's always just one person in a group who I do my whole teach. They're so confused. They just don't get it. And they say, okay, we're gonna do one round. We're gonna, you know, we're not gonna like score this. We're not gonna like keep track of who's winning, who's losing. It starts and then, you know, it clicks for them. They finally get it. Ah, I understand how to give clues now. I understand how to interpret other people's clues. It's great. I love seeing that moment. Sometimes, if you put people into a really competitive environment right at the start, they're just gonna zone out completely because they don't feel like that they're even in it. Um, my second story is, who's here heard of a game called Food Chain Magnate? Yeah, this is a really, this is a really spicy European game where your job is to become a restaurateur um, it is a horribly brutal game. It, there's actually a paragraph in the rules that say it, it is totally possible for you to make a mistake on the first turn and become so far behind it is impossible for you to come back and win. It doesn't mess around. <laughs> so I was taught this game um, and I had never played the game before and one other person had never played the game before and as a as it happened, that person was decided to go first. Mm. Just to briefly describe, all you do 
on your turn is you pick somebody to hire for your company. Um, we're a restaurant business, so they decided to hire a waitress. That makes sense, right? The person next to her then goes, who hires a recruiter whose job is to hire more people? Basically uh. doubling the number of actions you take in a turn. Then I went and I saw the expert at the game pick a recruiter. So I picked a recruiter and then so on and so forth. The person who had just learned the game made a decision that they thought was gonna make sense. It turned out to be the worst possible decision they could have made. And we kept going. They had a horrible time. I had a horrible time too, but that's because I'm <laughs> bad at games mostly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a really easy thing for you to do as you know the person who is teaching just to like, we're just gonna do one or two rounds of Food Chain Magnate just so you guys can see what it looks like you know, as your decisions get more complicated, even though you're only doing really one thing on your turn, it can quickly become a huge decision tree. Um, something like code names. You can, you just wait for the click and they'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, I got it now, but I accidentally killed all of us. You know, <laughs> we can go back and start again. Um, also, this is a good time, if your game has like a real time component to it, like, you know, if you have a sand timer you have to flip over and you're doing like a live auction, or if you're playing Galaxy Trucker, which is one of my favorite games, you're building a spaceship in real time, it's a good opportunity for you to simply practice that because when you're actually playing the game, because time is a factor, it's gonna be really hard for you to stop everything and kind of explain a rule if somebody has questions. Yeah, it's also really helpful when you have games that have some hidden information component, whether it's deception or just I have an objective that I'm not showing people, because during that training round, you can show the person who's teaching, I have this goal and I don't know what it means. Can you read it to me? Mm -hmm. Which during the game can be tough for everybody to play and feel like they're playing the real game when you have to give that kind of information once you've started. Yeah. And this can kind of loop all the way back to the start of actually picking the game and picking the audience. Um, if you're trying to get some novice board gamers into more advanced, maybe denser, longer games, picking a game that can easily be sort of like segmented onto a single round is really good because once again they're trying to learn new advanced mechanics something new something more difficult something more you know up here cerebral um, you know they might be for it but they also want to do their best so it's good for you to be able to s s take a step back um, my the game that I love for this is Mage Knight Mage Knight is a is a huge game it's basically got all the cool uh, mechanics you could name. It's got territory can control. It's kind of like worker placement. It's a deck builder. It's a RP, it's got crazy RPG elements. Um, but it also has a, a tutorial mission where you set it up in a particular way and then as you are going through this mission you are being taught additional rules. So you kind of start with just the bare minimum in order to get you out and moving and then as you go and explore you begin to learn new things about the game and by the time you finish that mission You've been fully taught the game. Um, another good example is a much more simple game called The Crew. Um, the Crew is a trick-taking game, which you know most people have an idea of what a trick-taking game is. If you've ever played uh, like any standard 52 deck card, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, if you've ever played with a standard deck of cards, most of those games are trick-taking games, and it's a very quick and easy concept to explain. The Crew has little missions you need to fulfill while you're doing all these tricks. Um, with the one sort of, I, I guess it's, I guess it, you can't talk during the whole time. And you're trying to do very particular things with the tricks. Like somebody needs to win a certain number. Somebody needs to win a certain number of certain suits. Somebody needs to win and get a very particular card. So it can be very difficult. But the tutorial mission, you know, mission zero, is you just try to win tricks. You just play it as a straight up trick taking game. Or you can play a regular mission, but you just allow yourself to talk. You can talk your way through. So when it comes time to keep your mouth shut, you kind of have an idea of where everyone's head is at, how everyone's thinking things through. You know what really would be great for this is legacy games. I wish leg more legacy games had demo turns in them because some of them are not based on normal games and you write on them at the end of them. Mm -hmm. Which is tough, and you put a, you can put stickers down in the wrong places, or like rip mm -hmm. the cards or up. And that's there forever. Yeah, 
they don't they don't have bonus ones they if don't. you ripped up the wrong ones. One uh, one thing I did want to mention is that board games are fun. They're yes. supposed to be fun, and a lot of them you need to play with other people. So if you're gonna take the time to teach people a board game, you probably want to play that with them and maybe play with them again. And if I am learning a new game and I make a dumb decision the first round because I didn't understand something and I just lose horribly, I probably won't play that game again. Or at least not with the group of people who just let me get destroyed for four hours, right? I've only played Scythe one time. <laughs> I've only played Food Team Magnate once. Yep. I'm Smash not going back. Mine. You can't make me. Yeah. Right, we all have it. We've yeah. all experienced it, which is why a sh short demo turn um, is helpful. Even if your players don't necessarily feel like they need it, it just puts everyone on slightly more even footing. Yeah. It's also really helpful for the one person in your play group who always exists, who you say, all right, we're going to sit down and learn how to play code names, and they say, I'll figure it out as we go. I'll, I'll, you don't need to worry about it. I'll, I'll pick it up as we go along. And that person's not paying attention the entire time. Right. So when you force them to have a training turn, then they go, oh, what was that actually? And then you have to re-explain some stuff, but at least they're now engaged because they've realized they don't know how to read. <laughs> Perfect story for that. Um, who here has heard of the game Citadels? Fantastic role selection drafting game. Yeah, so we were teaching Citadels. It was me, my partner, my sister, and her partner. Uh, and said sister's partner really only figured out how to play one of those roles. And he really wanted that role. So this wound up with us playing, you know, a standard Citadels game, 25 to 30 rounds. He was the king every time for 25 rounds because all he knew how to do was go first. And guess what? The king lets you go first. So, anytime he picked, anytime it was there, king, every time. So, for, especially for games specifically like that, where Citadels, I would say I'd teach it sort of how each role sort of behaves, because you can switch some out and they have the same general idea. Make sure people know what they're doing with the practice round. Uh, in this case, maybe even if someone's super keen on doing the same thing every time, maybe have them do something different so they can see there's more out there. We've even been playing the Gloomhaven practice campaign because Gloomhaven's a very big game and so it has a smaller <laughs> auxiliary game that you can play. That is the training game for you to learn how to play Gloomhaven, which has been very helpful. So for you this. can do very dumb things and die. And, and there's no yeah, stakes. There's no stakes, which I like. Name your character something stupid because it's the practice campaign. What did I name my character? Mine was one hat. Of, one of them was hat. Oh, Sparky Sparky Boom Man. Boom <laughs> Man, yes. It's a good energy. Yeah, so you're really just trying to draw out all the hidden questions. Like, you know, as you're going through the teach, mm -hmm. save your questions for the end. You know, there's a chance that that person might have just forgotten what their question was, or they might have felt like they really, really got the rules, and then they realize that they didn't, and then they need to ask a question. Or they might just, honestly, just be shy. They might think their question is really, really dumb. Um, as you can see, I have no problem asking the stupidest things. Yeah, and they're still my friends. <laughs> All right, awesome. So I think we just taught a board game, sort of, right? Yeah. Everyone feels Everyone, so we're all going to play after you this. You buy <laughs> Moonrakers in the, I don't know. Yeah, no, you've all been signed up for the Moonrakers tournament, actually. Yeah. It's uh, happening right this, after this. We've made it. It's, it's, it's here, so you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go anywhere. But in, in case you have other friends who can't go anywhere for reasons, or you don't have the time to get people together, or let's say there's maybe like a, a global pandemic or something that stops people <laughs> from coming together in spaces regularly. Well, we got virtual games for you, kids. So there are different options for virtual gaming. Um, there are a lot. I had one as a kid that was called Brett Spiel Wealth, which I don't know if anyone has heard of that, but it's basically a super old uh, German board gaming client online where they had like 50 games and they tried to make it like an MMO where you were like walking up to a table and asking someone to play. It was wild, but that was how I learned Carcassonne and Catan and a bunch of the classic games that no one will play with me anymore because I'm a jerk. Um, yes, there are many options. Tabletop Simulator is fantastic for this. Lots of people have modded in lots of games. Um, I think some of the most full-featured ones I've seen include Betrayal. Uh, there's all of Red Dragon Inn, and I mean 
all of Red Dragon Inn. That is many boxes. Um, yeah, there are there are lots of different options. There are even ports of very good games. Um, Wingspan has a very good Steam port. Very nice, very relaxing. As you play, well, Wingspan is a game where you are collecting birds. As you play birds into your area, the game will play the call of that bird every so often in the game. I didn't know that. that. Yeah, absolutely bonkers. Every every bird call is exactly how it is in real life. I know this. Trust me. I'm definitely a biologist. Um, We're all going home to play wingspan. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. It's so good. It counts all the rules and like count rules. Counts all the points for you. Words. I'm too excited. Um, Yeah. So can I digitally ask people to sort Jordan almonds? (laughs) No, they digitally can't. Yeah, that is the one down. Side you to the wingspan, like Jordan online Jordan. game, is that you can't eat the eggs. Ah. I mean, the physical game you also so can't, can't but eat you them. Might I, well, uh, that, we teach board games differently up here. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are there are many different ports. Root is very good, also online. Um, there are a lot, so look around. Um, obviously, if you're looking through Steam for ports, please check the reviews. There are some that are a little janky. Um, they may be by the same company and have to do with making wine. Um, yeah, there are there are lots of options. Feel free to explore them. I can't name all of them, otherwise we would be here forever. Um, but yeah, Tabletop Simulator is also kind of wonky. You might want to have an extra teaching session for how to use Tabletop Simulator <laughs> um, and how not to click the flip table button. That's a, that's a whole it's separate thing. So in the fun entire is game. <laughs> it's it's fantastic. I just want to throw objects? And yes, throwing objects is great. Yeah. Um, but not while you're trying to keep them in places. That's yeah, and as far as like using an online resource like these to sort of help with the teach, it because a lot of it is like heavily scripted and automated. It takes a lot of like the bookkeeping parts of the teach out. You don't really need to tell exactly what happens during the upkeep phase of this game if you just click a button and everything is done for you. You just kind of need to talk about the goes in and goes outs. This is like, I have a graphing calculator so I don't need to learn how to do math, but actually. Yes. (laughs) But like for real, and we understand that that is how the world works. Yeah, I believe uh, Splendor is very heavily animated on, or automated on Tabletop Simulator. But again, downside, you can't eat the gems. I want to touch Can, can we not them? eat board game components? I don't think it's that hard. If they stopped they making them, so... Hard candy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, I could, I could just run down a list of, like, board games with pieces that look like you should eat them. The Ascension yes. components? The Ascension components? Oh, those look like candy. Welcome to the panel within the panel. <laughs> We're going to rank the made top it. ten tastiest game the doors components. Are locked. This is yeah. the board game munch squad. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, things that look like edibles. The, oh. the tiles in the original Azul, those are Starburst those are pieces. Starburst. Those are Starburst. Yeah. <laughs> they, we ate yeah. before this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <we're done. laughs> All right, anyway, <laughs> that is the meat of our presentation, but we still have like Decent 20 amount of time. minutes. So, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Please. So, I have a comment and question. Sure. Well, the, the most uh, delicious flavor of board game pieces definitely comes from Azul. Yes. Yep. 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 They're so colorful. Yes. Any and all of They're them. They're so a Starburst. <laughs> yes, they are a Starburst. Uh, secondarily, so I think you were talking previously about uh, you go home and you're trying to teach your parents games or, or people that maybe aren't uh, as steep in the industry as you are. I'd like to hear from each of you one suggestion as to your most accessible game to teach people that have only played Theo and then opt in for Okay. We'll just throw what would be? Uh, so I don't know if this is uh, the most accessible, but it is just what is coming to mind right now. So I'm gonna go for it. It is my go-to like purse game. Um, we went to a concert recently, and I had it in my pocket, and I was able to teach it to the people waiting in line around me, and we played it together. It is set which is a set collecting game. So you like have an amount of cards out. You're looking for, um, you're looking for trios where either, where one of their attributes, where all of their attributes are either all the same or all different, which is really hard to understand when I'm saying that to you guys, but that is a great example of, you have to do a demo turn. There's just no other way to do it. I just lie the cards out, went through a turn, showed a few, sets until other people felt like very slowly explaining what I was doing until other people jumped in and then once they did reshuffle 
put back out and play. I really like um, escape room style games like Unlock or Exit or things like that because people now kind of understand the concept of an escape room and each play is different so it's just we're doing puzzles together, it's all together um, because for a lot of the older folks that are in my family they don't like to try and compete because they find it unsavory to lose all the games all the time, no matter how much attention they pay. I, don't, I can't understand the issue. But um, so when you're doing something collaboratively, that can help. And also something that doesn't feel like a modern board game can feel a little more accessible, perversely. Because some modern board games, they think, oh, I don't understand this concept of betrayal where we're exploring and then the rules change. Or, oh, one Eight Ultimate Werewolf, it has an app. Like, these things are not so familiar, but the idea of just solving little puzzles and accomplishing a goal can be pretty accessible. Yeah, so p picking a game that is like a mechanic, you know, a very, very simple thing is kind of with a good, strong hook, you know, what are you doing? Why is it fun? Those sort of, you can really explain those in like a sentence or two. You can pretty much get anybody at least willing to like sit down for a bit. Um, the one that I like, um, it's, a, it's a game that came out, I think, t three years ago. It's called Llama. Um, it is basically just like Uno. Um, so if, you're, if your family plays a lot of Uno, the game plays a lot like Uno, but it has a slight twist to it. Um, so it's gonna play a little bit differently. It's gonna get them, they're gonna be using those old Uno muscles in a new and different way. <laughs> so, L-L-A-M-A, yeah. Llama, yeah. You also just like llamas. Yes, and llamas, llamas, are, llamas are in right now. <laughs> so hot right now. So. So yeah, so if, like if you can think of like a, this game is like oh it's almost like you know some game that they're familiar with because you can basically keep the teach really short and punchy like that by saying oh it's Uno except you know whatever my, whatever the difference is it's Scrabble except all the tiles are just on the counter and it comes in a banana yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Scrabble but all the tiles go on top of each other yeah um, I've got actually I have Scout right here. Um, it's a very simple trick-taking game where if you can't beat someone else's tricks, you take from their tricks. So it's kind of like a, not necessarily a full-on backstabby betrayal type thing, but just more of a, if you can't beat them, pay them more for them to work for you. That's how that phrase works. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very quick. Um, got it just last year. Obviously, I've just kept this thing in my pocket all day. It's easy to move around and yeah it's a it's a pretty quick one uh it gets a little hinky but if people are willing to stick with you for like five minutes then they can play at least two rounds plays real quick I can go. you going yeah you oh. um i really like to suggest dixit to people because it's really easy to teach and you can just say it's just like apple sabbles but better and, and more and creative pretty. And yeah pretty. it's yeah. got pretty pictures so that's the one i always Teach my family. Yeah, any game with a tangible metaphor to another common game yeah, exactly. is going to be a big win. It's helpful, yeah. yeah. Okay. Are there Oh my god, so many. Uh, I can't even. Yeah, absolutely. Games that are frustrating to teach off the top I of have, my head. Uh, do you, do you want to go? Yeah. Okay. So I love deception games because I like talking to people and I like winning. And um, uh, so I really like Secret Hitler, but Secret Hitler can be really frustrating to teach to people, as is Two Rooms in a Boom. These yeah. are both yeah. hidden information, deception, I love intrigue, both of them. social games. That's my jam, but they require a lot of hidden information that has to be disseminated but only through the correct mechanics. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody in a game like Secret Hitler or Two Rooms in a Boom is consuming alcohol and they're like, I don't understand what my card is and I'm playing. What is the bomb, dude? What is the bomb? Is there like, can a bomb you look at this and tell me what it means? Also? Like, uh -huh. um, So those games um, require a non-zero amount of teaching. Everybody who's playing has to start at the same time, kind of with the same amount of information. And if a couple people don't get it, it can ruin the game for the people who do get it, like me. <laughs> yeah. And also, anyone else who knows how the game works. Because people might not come up and ask me, the person who taught the game, the question, but they'll go and they'll ask John, who's played the game, and then John will get a question, and now you know information that you shouldn't have known because you're also playing, right? So, like, it ruins the currency of the game, which is when you get to learn things, which has, like, mechanical consequences. 
also, those are social games that sometimes play like 25 people and everybody has to be quiet in a room at the same time or I'm gonna yell and it's yeah. frustrating. Um, and so I try, I'll send out a YouTube video beforehand a lot of the time to be like, hey, we're all hanging out and playing this game. There is a quiz. <laughs> and the quiz is, are we gonna have fun playing this game? Uh, I promise I'm nice about it. But, um, so it's, it's helpful to just send a, a five minute YouTube video along and then everybody shows up. We teach it just as if they hadn't watched the video, but they get some familiarity beforehand. Yeah, uh, mine is uh, Letter Jam, which oh. uh, I've, I, I, yeah, it is impossible to teach. It's, uh, um, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to even give a brief overview of what it is, but everybody has uh, a hidden word that they can't see individually spelled out with like one letter at a time, and it's all scrambled. So everyone's got you know some letters in front of them that they can't see, and, but you can see everybody else's letters. Your goal is to, using the letters that you see available to you, spell out a word. And then you just like indicate which letters you use to spell the word, and then because everybody has like some pieces of the information, some, they, like they know some letter was used because they can see other letters, they can't see their own. They need to deduce what that word was like and find the missing letter and that's the letter that they have. If you're kind of lost right now, <laughs> yeah. the easiest way I've found to actually like explain this game is just like, guys, it's really fun. We're just going to sit down and we're just going to play. <laughs> and, and you're yeah, going to get it. Hold on, big, hold, on. Big hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Ta -da. Yes. This is. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Literally, yes. <laughs> there, like, like I mentioned, like during the, you know, tutorial, like training, you know, turns, like, the, that click. Some games have a lot more click than others. Yeah, you can hear the starter yeah. on this game in people's brains. Like you'll hear, oh, I get it. Yeah. And then that's how, you, like, all the rules now yeah. fall into place. But for some games, like, there is a lot more of like you kind of need to get in there to really yeah. see what's going on. Because otherwise, trying to explain, you're playing Hanabi, but it's actually a foreign language entrance exam in English. <laughs> it's like tough. It's t tough to explain. Um, I would probably go anything in the, like if we're, if we're stacking mechanics, you've got at least three going on. Uh, Scythe is a hard one to teach. Um, I have not attempted to teach Arc Nova yet, but that game is heavy, and I don't just mean you can defend yourself with it. There is a lot going on in that game. So, again, that comes back to knowing your audience. Uh, games will be less frustrating. Uh, wow, I just had a stroke. Games will be less frustrating. There we are, English. Um, if you know who you're teaching them to and how to teach it to them, because different people learn different ways, too. So, like, my partner's very visual. I'll show them the pretty pictures while we're going over what's going on, that sounds really patronizing. It's not, it's just how to teach it to them. Uh, and you mentioned like knowing your audience. I, th I just wanna touch on that uh, for a second. If you are playing a game or trying to sell playing a game with your like more board game friends, you can use uh, language with them that gets the point across way quicker. Like if I told Arden we're gonna play this really cool new like Build-A-Bag game that I got. She already knows. And like half of the mechanics. on the counter, and I'm going to build it. No, okay. <laughs> nice. Stop being silly. Or like territory control. You know what you're getting yourself into, right? You have an understanding of what we're doing. You, It's like a cheat code, you know? But yeah. I wouldn't say that to someone who I'm just teaching games for the first time. Maybe at the end I would be like, that is a XYZ game. That is a drafting-based game. That yeah. is a deck build blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's a good summation for people who are just starting into board games. Like, once you're all the way done with the game, you can be like, okay, that was a deduction game with these elements, so that the next time we play something, hey, do you want to play a deduction game? Sure, I know what that is. Right? Or play. no, I don't want or to. Or no, I don't want to I play a deception game, Arden. Or is it, uh, speaking of, is it a reaction speed game? Because if so, don't play with Arden, okay? <laughs> You'll lose and you'll be sad. <laughs> yeah, nobody plays Jungle Speed with me anymore. That's because I still have scars. Yeah, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had another question back there somewhere. Yes. I saw you first, yeah. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. You mentioned Dixit, and that is a great game because that, that is the type of game that's fun even if you lose. Yeah, yes. exactly. Right. Yeah. exactly. The thing I thought about Dixit is after you go through the cards, you get to know them really well. Yes. With other games like Mysterium or yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Spooky it digs it, as I like yeah. to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Another really good one is Just One. Just One. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Dixit. Yes. Yeah. Dixit is amazing, and uh, you also mentioned Mysterium. Like, if you your friend group loves Dixit and you want to kind of move them on to like, you know, what's the next thing? Move them on to Mysterium. Asymmetric, mm -hmm. semi-competitive co-op. Yeah, and then like, once and then once they've mastered Mysterium, you do Obscurium. It's spooky with crows and a traitor. traitor. Also. And <laughs> now it's traitor. evil oh. Mysterium. And you can still well, lift yeah, the pieces. Can, we can no, yeah. we've got a list coming. We had another, I believe. Yeah. Hit him with a squirt bottle. Yeah. Um, uh, it, dep it really depends on the person that you're dealing with, to be honest. Sometimes, okay, uh, Lauren, I'm going to call you out, but yeah. in a very positive yes. way. Uh -huh. Lauren... Has ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes. But so if Lauren starts to, like, drift focus or whatever, I can just... I know Lauren, if I tell her, Lauren, come on, let's get back to the game, she will come back into the game, you yeah. know? Uh, uh -huh. If the person you're playing with doesn't quite have that energy, maybe the game you're teaching is just not, it's not the time to do it. Maybe you take a pause, you go get a snack, and you come back and try and focus up again. It really just depends on Or you your give them group. something to do with their hands, which is like... Distract I, and involve again. I dissociated the entire time Arden was explaining Moonrakers. If I had a deck of cards in my hand, I would have... I had no you would have had it all. Game right now. The competitive yep. Magic the Gathering yeah. card. Uh -huh. <laughs> they don't even have to be related uh. to the game. They can be any card. You need a fidget just spinner. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, the other thing that can be helpful is using your training turns as also like a test the water. So you tell the people are not super invested in the explanation. Maybe you don't want them to like give up on the game immediately, but maybe you say, hey, we're gonna play one round and then if we don't wanna play this game anymore, we can try something else. But I think that you should try and play it for just one round and you know that there's an exit strategy right at the end of it. Right. Because nobody wants to be the person who is like halfway through an hour and a half long game and you say, actually, I'm bored, I'm not having fun, can we pick it up? Mm -hmm. But being 100% of the way through a 10 minute tutorial and saying, okay, I'm done with this one is a lot less, uh, it's a lot more palatable for people. Yeah, uh, what, was the, what was the role playing game I tapped out of? Oh, I Dark Overlord? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I realized like, I, I'm like, okay, I'm so excited for it. And I realized like, I can't be a jerk to my friends. And I just like, I can't, but guys, can we do something else? I don't want to RP as a goblin <laughs> as a trying to backstep person. my friends. Yeah, as a little brown dozing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. If Actually, yeah. I, yeah, if I, well, I, last night we were playing a board game yeah. uh, and there were some rules that I did not find to be particularly fun. So I will teach my house rules. Uh, I do like to preface by saying that. If it is a house rule, I'd be like very obvious. I don't necessarily need, feel the need to explain what the rule book rule is, but I will say my house rule is this, that's what we're doing. Just so if they want to play it a different way or they play it at another time, they understand why that is. Um, and then if there are people that are as board gaming as me, I'll explain why it is a house rule. Yeah. yeah, like when the first time I taught Arden and Jess the Stardew Valley co-op game, I was like, the way they stack up the time is dumb. <laughs> because, and X, Y, Z, um, I just kind of like told them, hey, we're gonna do a house rule where we put all the stuff in because otherwise the Stardew Valley board game is not, it's not the most balanced of all games that I've played. Um, we barely came in under the wire winning with the house rule. So like, again, it, it, there's a lot in the, in the know your audience component and another one is if people understand games enough, you can tell them why we're doing it this way. Otherwise, if they don't get it, you can just be like, hey, this is the best way to play this game or this is a way I've found to make this more fun. Here's what we're doing. Yeah, this is also an opportunity where if you're not the one teaching the game, but you've like played the game before, this is a good opportunity for you to practice not talking. Um, mm -hmm. Shutting it down. Very good. Uh, if somebody like, if the person giving the teach like tells a rule wrong, teaches a rule wrong, like decide right then and there, is this a super critical rule that they have messed up? And do I need to step in and correct it? Most of the time the answer for that is gonna be no. Um, so just play it out. Um, there's a, there's a, my favorite roll and write, it's called Long Shot. It's a horse racing game. And one of the things you can do is make horses become friends with other horses. <laughs> there's, and we got the rule exactly backwards, where instead of um, 
you roll a dice and that indicates the horse that you're going to be doing stuff to uh, that particular <laughs> round. <laughs> I'm not doing... Don't. We're moving yes, on. yes, yes, yes. That's a different panel and a different convention. And it's late at night. <laughs> Please continue. Give me a moment. Okay. Um, and one of the things is like, okay, so the number one horse, um, if you want to make horses friends, um, you can either mark off on the one horse, the one horse is now friends with the two horse, or you can mark on the two horse that the two horse is now friends with the one horse. Uh. They're the exact opposite of each other. We taught it, according to the rule books, backwards. But it made no difference at the end of the game because we all played by the same rules and we determined a winner. So those sort of things, you know, if you are experienced with the game, Mention at the end, like, hey, we did kind of get this backwards, so for next time. Um, this happens to me a lot when I teach really complicated games, like, like I'll bring up Mage Knight again, it's a million different mechanics. Um, at the end of, uh, of the mission, or whenever we decide to stop playing, I'll, even, I'll be like, oh, I got like six rules wrong, by the way, we'll go over what I got wrong next time. Because I don't want to, like, impede the flow of play, because once you're going, you want to you keep that energy up. The worst thing that can happen is being like, oh, I've got to open up the rule book now. And it puts a whole halt on the whole gameplay experience. Yeah, and generally, if you've realized halfway through that you got a rule wrong or were playing something wrong, if at all possible, we found it's easiest to continue as if the wrong rule was correct for the whole session. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of situations where you can correctively change the rules mid-game. Um, because, for example, you might have just made foundational gameplay decisions that are just not correct, but everyone did them, and undoing them is not possible. Or one person did it and decided to play around a mechanic that is not actually there. Right. They, and they would just lose if we changed the right. rules mm. back to the original. So, so usually you just coast through. Yeah, and then you say for next game, like, hey, just so you know, either if you play this with me or with someone else, you can't do this thing that you did. Mm -hmm. We all did it, it's fine, but that's not in the rules, so, mm -hmm. so you can't do that, so don't expect it next time. But trying to say, oh, actually, I know that you've been looking at the top card of the deck, the first step in every round, you're not allowed to do that, and so now you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Really takes people out of it, especially when they're learning. Yeah. I have written on components before to clarify rules because someone at this table wearing a hat has written rules or has read rules incorrectly and resulted in winning by a large margin that they should not have had. <laughs> Who could that have been? Oh. Yes. Uh, it depends a little bit on how magnanimous you are. The question is, is there a benefit to being as the teacher like an observer instead of a player in the game and just always being available? So those of us who worked at the board game cafe, that was what we did, was we floated around and we would only answer rules questions. It's nice because you have a person uh, to ask if you have a question that involves looking at your um, identity card in two rooms in a boom. You're like the, the party master at that point. Um, so they have a place they can go to of somebody who's not playing, which means all questions are valid. Um, I have found that some, like, as a player, if I went to somebody's house for game night and they said, it's okay, I'm not going to play, I'll just be here, I would feel like I was imposing. Um, because that, that, like, observer is not getting to play the game at the game night in a different way than like the GM of your D&D campaign is playing D&D with you, they're just playing a different role. Um, so I think that some people might find that like socially challenging as an attendee of your board game night where they might feel like they're asking too much and being a bother. So if there are games where you can successfully give that information, at the very least enough to be the observer during the trial rounds and then play during the actual game, I think that would probably be the best option um, so that people don't feel like they're having to pay you for your time of teaching them instead of just having fun. Uh, it is 3.30 right now, um, which I believe is when we have to be done. Yes. Um, we're going to hang around, obviously. We love talking about board games. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. You guys have been great. <laughs> Thank you.